It was my fault. It was no one else's fault. I went to that environment. I had misjudged it and I'd misjudged it as well because everybody was like super excited to see me, but I hadn't really factored in this idea of great. Well, how do I talk with people? The negatives of it are my impulse control is very, very bad. I didn't really realize that until later, but I have a really bad impulse control and that came to light from binge eating, to be honest with you. I need to find somebody and then I have to chase that person down. And it's not for any reason. I can't compete against myself. I have to compete against someone else and they've got to be somebody who is out of my league significantly. Hello, this is episode 11 of the Smart ADHD podcast and I'm joined by my friend Ash Borland, who is a business owner, father and minimalist. His mission is to simplify success driven by determination to thrive with dyslexia and ADHD. This is another Smart ADHD Stories episode. Let's get on with this episode. Ash, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. How are you doing? I'm very excited to be here, Ian. I'm really excited, actually. Super, I looked at my diary today and was like, yes, this is going to be a good day. <laughs> we are. We, and it's always great talking about, well, get, you know, getting into, into the deep stuff, isn't it? Because uh, we were, we, so we, we actually met in person for the first time a few weeks ago. I And I'm really confused about this because I'm sure I thought we had actually met in person. But we've known each other for a few years and we you've... Yeah, you've been on my podcast, my other podcast, my Confident Live Marketing yes. podcast before. We've talked a lot about video content and confidence and that type of thing. But we talked about ADHD at this conference. This was at TubeFest in Birmingham. And we also talked about the fact that we don't really do small talk. We just like to get right <laughs> into the depths, don't we? And I think that's what yeah. we did. In fact, actually, we've been talking for the last 10, 15 minutes. And I said, Ash, you need to stop because you're giving too much good stuff. We need to get into the recordings. So... I'd like to ask you, um, when did you first realize that you had ADHD? So this is not so much like getting diagnosed, but like, mm. what are the kind of the origin stories for you? So I've always had um, dyslexia. Um, I've always felt different. So that's so I've had dyslexia and I always felt a bit different. The way I behave is always just a little bit odd. Um, there's, and so when I say odd, just, just a bit out of the norm to everyone else. So I've always had that. I didn't really notice there was something majorly kind of not wrong because it's absolutely wonderful. I love it. But anything was majorly a, like different to people until probably 2020. Um, so I'm I'm 32 now. So I would have been what? Like, like the 30s, early 30s, no, late 30s, something like that. Yeah, no, late 20s. Um, and I started noticing that maybe I was just a little bit different. It was maybe that when I started doing my work, I started to be like, okay. And then when my son was born was where it really happened. So once my son was born and his development started going through, um, he was born in 2020. And that's when I, you know, that, as it started to develop and it's quite quick. It, once he started moving toys, playing, talking, mm. it was just like, I do that. I do that. I do that. And when you started putting it with other children, it was like, Hmm, maybe maybe there's something a little bit different about me because I'm doing that and my wife isn't like that and she was like oh well we got to get checked and I went and got checked and that was that was it that was the kind of the initial but it was it's always been there and I have very strange habits and tendencies that that have that have both both been a detriment to my life and also a massive making of it but it was only really probably on my radar from about 2020 that's that's really interesting yeah and and that's what we've talked about a lot on this show in the past ADHD has its positives and it has its negatives. And, and I don't want to, we're not about sugar coating. We're going to talk about mm. the negatives, but also there are some positives as well. It's, we're not going to, it's not like a doom fest either. So hopefully we'll, we'll talk about those. <laughs> so you, you, so you said like you discussed this with your wife, who, which of you first kind of came up with, pos came up with thinking that this might be ADHD. I mean, presumably you were thinking that this might be ADHD. Um, yeah. So how did that conversations? Happen? Yeah. So I thought it could either be ADHD um, or autism was what I was thinking, and um, that was kind of where it was. And it and it was my wife. It was my wife that we, we the discussion came across was I was like um, from like our son as I said it was our son that we were talking about it, and also my behaviours. So the way I live and the way I am is very 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 well intense and that's always been a uh, past partners always said that you're like gosh I, you know i really you know he's great but he's super intense like when he gets into stuff he's like <laughs> into stuff 
and I've probably got a little bit of, it's not diagnosed this, but OCD as well. My sister is a psychiatrist and she was like, she does a twitch, and she was like, mm, you want to check that one out too. There's a little bit of a tendency there as well, but it's, uh, but it's, but it, um, it was her that said it. She was like, I think we, our son's called Paris. She said, I see in Paris, he's doing these things. You do those things. Other kids aren't really doing those. She maybe uh, have a look at what that would be. And then, and also like silly little things like I, the way that just the way I live my life, my entire day, we'll, we'll unpack it. I'm sure as you go through, but like my entire day is a very strange structure, a super over hyper focused structured day. I'm obsessed with things to a whole new level. And it was just my wife said, it, she was like, I think you probably need to, to, to get that looked at. Mm. Um, and at the time I didn't want any, I don't, I don't take any medication and I don't, wouldn't want any medication, but it was more about, I'd always known there was something there, but it was her saying it of like, we need to know because you need to know how to deal with our son. And if that's going to come and he's not being diagnosed, he's too young still, but the doctor with the GP, when I thought, when we took the, to, the GP originally and we were chatting about it and he was like, yeah, it's probably hereditary and then the specialist and so on and so forth. They were like, yeah, there's a very high chance. In fact, nearly definite. Um, and my yeah. mum definitely is as well. But it was my wife that was like, you need to, I think not you need to, because we have a very, very like open relationship in this way. But she was like, I think it's something you should explore to be able to help our son better. And, and it has helped me to be fair. Yeah. And that's a similar story for me. It was, with our kids and thinking, well, I want to try to understand my kids more and, and the, the way their brain works, but it has really helped me. There was a little bit though of, yeah, this kind of not wanting to go down the, the putting myself, you know, attaching a label to myself. Mm -hmm. And I had to go through a lot of thinking about that. Was there any of that? Were there any kind of, I think you've kind of mentioned this a little bit, but were there any things that you were concerned about about going down this this <clears throat> route of getting a diagnosis did did you worry that maybe the there wasn't going to be anything that you were you were absolutely fine and, and what that would feel like <laughs> no i didn't thought about that to be fair. i knew there was definitely <laughs> something um, i y yeah no so like i'm a big advocate of um rightly or wrongly it's my opinion it's not a person it's just my own self thing is i don't like medication now, now, joking aside, I am on meds for a deal. I have an autoimmune disease, so it's a separate thing. So, so uh, I, but I didn't want a medication. And the reason being, so for me, that was my biggest fear, was what has made me successful. And in in all walks of my life, I'm very being very. Um, people always, you know, I was listening to a podcast this morning. They said people say you're built different, and it's about this individual. And I was like, I get that a lot. People, are like, I don't understand how you can do these things. And I always say to people, I don't understand how you can't. And I know that's because my brain is wired in a different way to a lot of people. And there was a fear of, please don't come in and like, it's working. I'm happy with it now. And so it was a fear of this idea of like, I don't want to lose that, that what makes me me and what makes me successful and makes me excited and, and like overly passionate. Cause I am extremely overly passionate about things to the point which, which is what kind of, barrels me through work and success because I'm more into it than anybody else. Um, I didn't want to lose that, but I, and then I was worried about that. But then what mm. I did find is well, once I was di going through the diagnosis process and seeing the specialist and all that type of stuff that I um, also realized there's lots of other things in my life that it was affecting. And actually I should like, as in, in a negative way, and I should probably take control of it. And now like I say, 2022 was a diagnosis and, 2024 now like it's about a year ish just over a year kind of give or take and just like uh, eight, eight months and and it has been a big difference knowing it i think you can know what mm. what the, the it's nothing wrong with it but it's just but i did think it was going to be i thought it was going to be autism if i'm going to be honest i was quite shocked with the adhd because i'm not like hyper well, i guess i kind of yeah am. but i'm <laughs> but like i'm not like i was thinking oh maybe it's autism but it's not but it was but it was adhd but yeah i find that um I was a little bit nervous about the, the the drugs and the labeling of everything. Yeah. And when the specialist I spoke to was like, "You just you don't have to take them if you don't want to." Like it's up to you. And I was like, "Okay, I won't." Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's an important thing because I had the same kind of concerns about the you know going down the med medication route. Uh, the in the the ADHD thing is with the hyperactivity can be. It's, it's a strange thing because yeah, I'm not physically hyperactive, but what I've realized since is that I am mentally mm. hyperactive, and, and so. 
you know, it, it, we're, there are as many different types of ADHD as there are people with ADHD. It's important to say that. And of course, if you're watching and listening and you have a different experience, that's totally okay. You know, what we're not saying here is that medication is wrong. It might absolutely be the right thing for you. Uh, I'm not currently taking medication, but I'm actually in the process of thinking, you know, I've spent the last three, three and a bit years without medication, approaching it from a holistic point of view. I am starting to think maybe maybe I should think about medication and, and it's not yeah. there's no right or wrong here if you are if, if there's any kind of thing that we bring up in this conversation today then do make sure that you um see a medical professional you know we're not we're not mm. experts here we're, we're telling a story so thanks for that ash that's that's really interesting i have a similar kind of a similar kind of story that's really interesting so so that was it so that was uh when did you say you were you were diagnosed was that last year no, 2022. Before. So 2020, 10 2022. Okay. I think it was September 2022. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's go back into the past. Let's go back to Ash when he was a, a young boy. Thinking about your childhood, like <laughs> looking back now that you're looking at looking through a kind of an ADHD lens, or you're looking through with with the benefits of clarity and insight. What do you see about you know you as a young boy that's knowing that you had ADHD kind of helps you understand that that person then? Oh, there's so much. Um, oh, that's a really good question. So I was, I've always been somebody that finds things very easy. So I find things very, but then on the other side of things, and this is with a kid, things that don't interest me, I find very hard. Hmm. And I never really understood why. I never got, I just would, I honestly had those thoughts lazy. So you look at that, I just think I'm quite lazy. And I would be in, so examples would be, I'd be in top sets for everything. I'm quite, and then one thing we found at the back of this, I have very high IQ, which I didn't know. So I ended up having a much like, like Mensa IQ. And, but it kind of made sense looking back because I was in top set for all things, but just wouldn't do them. And yet in the same light, I would go home and obsess on like, anything that that would be at that moment i would obsess on it to the point where i could tell i was like an encyclopedia this is before the internet and everything like that but it was like you know i would know everything about it and it that was something that there the was the other kids other friends of mine no one was really doing that and it never really it was it was never really noticed i think as a kid um i was just always my mom just says he's very quiet he's just very creative i come from a performing arts background similar to yourself so like mm. I come from musical theatre background. Um, you're not. You're you're a classical trained singer, but I, yeah, mine's MT. But I didn't start, and that's you'll get this actually with your story. I, up, I didn't start doing musical theatre till I was 14. That's when this thing really started to happen, because up until that point, it was video games was my kind of obsession and Star Wars. So I was I knew everything about all of it, and that was my that was my like hyper obsession. Didn't care about anything else. So that was where it was noticeable, but but hidden. It's quiet in the corner. No one really noticed. It then became very clear when I decided I wanted to dance. Um, my mum was a dance teacher. I started breakdancing. And that's when all of a sudden that kind of built different thing, just kind of that hyper obsession of like, this is my thing. And I, all my grades, everything just fell down. And all I did was dance and sing and perform and act. And, and that was it over and over and over again. And I just, well, I blew through everything. I got scholarships. I got work. I got, it was just, it was like gone from this lazy person. What, what I deemed myself as lazy, couldn't study, couldn't do anything. Wasn't very intelligent to all of a sudden, like I was just knocking back every challenge that came. It was, it was actually, there's a video actually on YouTube of me. My wife, we found it. My wife was like, gosh, that's crazy. And I'm like 14 and I'm in front of like two and a half thousand people. And I'm going, hi. So, and I'm super shy, but it was like, hi, oh, nice to meet you. Like I'm dancing today because I've done this and I've won this competition. And and she was like, you're like 14 and you're, and I, and I looked and, and again, that's what you say when you look back at the time, it was just in the moment, but I looked back and I was like, that's insane. Like that's insane. Like I was owning this thing as if, and it was because of this tunnel vision of focus of all, there was nothing else that mattered. Every, and I'd come home, I'd edit, I'd edit the videos, I'd edit the music, I'd edit the, I just lived, breathed and slept and slept it. And I couldn't talk about anything else. There was not like for my entire 14 to 20, really, 
if you wanted to talk to me, you better talk to me about forming arts of some sort. And, and it just got deeper into classical, into it just got more classical ballet, classical singing, classical, it just kept going and going and going and going and going. That's where I noticed the difference. And then, by the way, it just stopped and kind of hid away for a number of years until this started happening again. And my, before the, this, this, this thing we do now, um, as in this creative job that we both kind of work in. Um, but as a kid, it was looking back at it then, it was this obsession of like doing things that, that no other real kid of my age in my school and in my area was doing. But it was always very intense. Yeah. And, and and it was, and my son does the similar, like he obsesses on things. But my mum was like, you did that from a young age. You always would pick something, repeat, watch things. And that's what I do. I watch things and I watch them over and over and over and over again. And then my background in performing and, you know, especially from, a, from an acting point of view and will actually dance more than anything is you mimic. So I would learn what people would, I just, if you watch something enough and you pick up a skill of learning it, you would learn everything. And that, to me, looking back at it, you say about going back to it as a child, all of it makes sense. And all of it is like, of course you do what you do today. Of course you'd have, but it didn't feel like it when you're in the moment. I'm sure it's very similar. I'm sure if people listen to this with ADHD will all, you, I'm sure you've had a similar experience. It all felt like a chaotic mess in the moment. In the moment <laughs> I felt like I was just bouncing around, not focused, not anything, but actually looking back at it, it was like, oh no, I was hyper focused um, to, a, yeah. to a detriment to a lot of things. And this is where the, the phrase attention deficit hyperactivity mm. disorder is, is not helpful because quite often it's, it's not a deficit of attention. It's, it's like an over, over abundance of it. And, you know, this hyper focus can be a good thing, but it also has its downsides as well. Now you, you mentioned high IQ and I mean, that's one of the things that we talk about on this smart ADHD mm. podcast, because intelligence, intelligence does play a role or it can affect the way ADHD is manifested. Do you think, well, how do you think your intelligence affected your ADHD? Do you think it made things easier, made things more difficult? It, because I've, heard, you know, some people say that if you if you're intelligent, you you find ways to mask your ADHD and to find ways around it more easily. What's your experience with that? Um, so like anyone who knows me, knew me, like and see me in my day to day life, you would not think I have ADHD because I manage it really really well it's only if you know me properly and and the way i do it so i think um yeah so my iq to give people context my iq is 143 um and it which was what it was when we had it all tested at that point which i didn't know was high or good or not it turns out it's very good it made more sense once i read learned that because i was like the thing that i would struggle with is one my my focus and, and i'll talk about the masking there but my focus was very very high on things so I could focus on things a lot more than others. And then I also found was that I could understand things that others couldn't seem to get. And that would, I find that very frustrating. So people would talk about things, oftentimes actually events that we go, like we met, at, people would talk about stuff on stage. And I'm like, really? Like, really? Like, we, why does the general, why do we need to know that? Like, that's super obvious. Like, and it's like, it took me a long time to realize like, no, it's not that, it's not that everyone's stupid. It's just everyone's smart. I just have a, my brain is just that took me a while to figure that out mm. um, which helped but it was very liberating because actually helped my business with that because then what happened was i started having to quote dumb it down because i was making the mistake of trying to show it how i would see it instead of bring it back down level so that really helped um but i do think that the that having a higher iq and having a higher intelligence makes it in some ways i can figure it out in better ways i can make sense of it in other ways, and I, I just, so I have a, I, and again, I'm very open about this. I have a rare kidney disease and I was with my nephrologist yesterday. And the first thing he said when I came through the door, he had like a couple of people who were with him, like, like trainees. And he said, this is Ash. Ash knows everything about everything to do with kidney disease. And, um, he knows everybody who's had it. And also he'll tell you all these other things. And I was like, oh, he was like going through it and he was laughing, making a joke. And he said, I think you just, you're too smart for your own good and he's because i'll like quote the measurements of the different things back to him and he's like you don't need to know any of that just chill out and i think that because it's all good everything's fine but he's and he always laughs about it 
So I do think that in a weird way, it, um, it, it, it's good and bad. It's good and bad because mm. I over, overthink and then I'm overthinking on such a molecular level. Yeah. I can, like, I start thinking and I get really into like, um, medical papers and that's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll sit and listen and I'll, and I'll spot a speechify because I'm dyslexic. So I'll listen to it while I'm running at three speed, listening to like the latest medical papers. My, my nephrologist sends me the papers when he's now, cause he's like, yeah, he just, cause he just, like, knows that that's what I'm like. It's too much. And if I'm honest, I don't think it helps. I'd rather, it'd be nice to dial it down a bit. <laughs> Yeah, it has its has its pros and cons, but the, yeah, yeah, the overthinking thing is it can be a big issue, I think, and that also means that those potential negative voices in your head that we that we kind of are manifested in in situ different situations. We were talking about this before we hit record. They can almost be even more convincing, I think, because mm. we just we've got over. We've already got overly active minds having ADHD, but if you have high intelligence as well, it's kind of that almost exacerbates that and. Yes, uh, I don't think it's a gift. I think that the as in not ADHD. I mean the I, the IQ thing. I don't think is a gift. I don't. I of of all of the things that I do don't have whatever it is the way we're built. The IQ thing is the one I would rather dampen down than turn. Like that is the one I I would personally. I don't think it's a f cool thing to have. I think it's hard to see to see things where people don't see them. I find that very hard. Like really, really frustrating. I suppose it depends, like, if you were, like, a scientist who's, who's oh, yeah. trying to kind of discover something new, then it would probably be quite helpful. But uh, Not so you know, much in, like, my line of work, to be honest. In financial <laughs> services, it attracts more money people than it does smart people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and But, but you know, in combination with ADHD, and, you know, I think this is more of an American term, but 2E, this, you know, this twice exceptional thing mm -hmm. can be... An issue, and I think this is particularly an issue when you're getting diagnosed, uh, particularly if you're younger or if you're female. Particularly, I've heard it can cause problems because the the people who are diagnosing you can say, "Well, like, like Ash has got it all sorted. You know, he's 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 coping okay." That's that's the potential, but thankfully, that a lot. <laughs> thankfully, you you did see somebody who was able to diagnose you, and that's been really helpful for you. So, my next question to you is. Uh, how has having ADHD affected you both personally and professionally? And you've touched on this a little bit, but I'm interested to kind of digging into both the pros and the cons. Like how has mm -hmm. this affected, how does this affect you on a day-to-day -day kind of way? So um, the, the, the pros to it, how, it, how it's affected me on a day-to-day -day way is um, I live a very structured, so, okay, let me, let me start that at the beginning to kind of give you kind of context. So the way I looked at it when I was diagnosed was I was like, okay, the way that I see my brain is I see it like a bowling alley. So you think about your, there's a, a goal we're trying to achieve that the pins are at the end. And the way that I described it to my wife and how I set up my life, I was like, if I roll a bowling ball down the, the alley, I'm trying to hit those pins. 10 is the, the best day or whatever. It's like most people can roll it down. That's fine. I said, but but me, I'm going to roll it and it's going to go in the gutter a lot of times because I get distracted and get things like that. So I had to just try and find a way to effectively put those guardrails up in my life. So to try and find, you know, the guards, when you put the rails up, when you bowl and you can, you can then bounce it off. You have your kids and you roll the ball and it bounces off as much as it wants, but it's inevitably going to hit the pins at the end. That was the vision in my head when I got diagnosed. Like, that's what I need to do. I need to find a way of creating guardrails in my life that will allow me to feel creative and feel and feel whatever my ADHD needs to feel at that moment. But I am still heavily rooted in this parameters of, of like you can and can't you can't go outside of the of the of the kind of the rules. And that is how it has affected my day to day life, both positive and negative, both positive and negative, because my entire life is is governed i'm very very strict like super strict because i i want to um be as successful as i can be and provide for my family and and have the best life i possibly can and so within that i one thing i looked at when i started researching was that discipline and structure seem to be the best thing for people with adhd it is discipline and structure forcing yourself to do the things when you don't want to do them can really help even though it's painfully boring um, I still do it. So I'm in my day-to-day -day life. I wake up the same time. 
I do I do the same thing every day, seven day, pretty much seven days a week. On the weekends are a little bit more relaxed, but I mean like I eat the same food, I do exactly the same thing, I wear the same clothes. Like my entire life is like Groundhog Day, and um, that has got more since being diagnosed because I'm able to do a lot more with it. Like everything, I play the same video game at night. I eat like you know, I do like everything. So that's been a real positive because what's really funny is when you start to do that, um, you get you get very good at things if you do things every single day. And so the the, the net positive of that has been you know much better relationships, close to my kids, close to my wife. Which is why actually when I met you, it throws me out in those events because I'm highly stressed because I'm now no longer in the in the event. I'm I'm now no longer in my daily routine. Mm. Um, so in my day to day life embracing it has been massive and and has actually realized that that's my superpower and it's what makes me significantly more of an output than other people and going more into it has been um has been a game changer the negatives of it are my impulse control is very very bad i didn't really realize that until later but i have a i have um really bad impulse control and that came to light from binge eating to be honest with you so I've lost, instead of okay, give an example of this, but I'm now currently, I've lost 42 kilos in weight in uh, 11 months. Um, so really, really fast. It's like six and a half-ish stone, I think, roughly. I don't know the stones. It's kilos I work in. So your American audience will be like, what is that? Um, <laughs> but um, that was because I just put on so much weight from binge eating. And that was, I couldn't understand why. There was no emotional reason behind it. It was just dopamine impulse i've no impulse control of it at all and that's why i have to find these these rules these guidelines it's a new thing i put in place like i eat i, I like today I've, I've eaten finish at 12 o'clock i won't eat any food now until tomorrow because all i can think about then is food my and it's just these weird things in my work it's not so much it does cause me a lot of anxiety though i do get a lot of anxiety as well i'm quite open it sounds really miserable here i'm just being like open about what it is but um but my biggest one is impulse. I can't have something, you know, when people say, just have something in moderation. I just don't. And I never really knew why. And when I say like moderation, I mean like the food I was eating was disgusting. Like it was, at one point we were eating, I was eating, we, I was eating two large pepperoni pizzas a day, about four to five bars of 100 grams of chocolate a day three pasties a day like it was just ridiculous and it wasn't for any reason other than that, like when i looked back at it and realized it dopamine it was just dopamine it was just sit work mm. eat yep 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 and so i noticed that in everything so i as obsessive as i can be on positive things if i don't catch myself phone is a bad one technology um youtube <laughs> be a bad one um you can end up getting that, that I've, I've noticed that with me. So I live a very restrictive life. And um, in that, I remember listening to a quote um, from Checker Willick, where it was listening to a podcast, but he said, and, he, and his thing is like, discipline equals freedom. And that's what helped me. It was like, if I'm disciplined, I will be free and I can then feel happy about it. And it works for me. And it, done my, and it, might, not, it might not work for a lot of others, um, but, it, but I, I have to be like all or nothing. And... Um, and so my life is a lot of nothing. <laughs> That's fascinating. There's so many things I want to kind of come back to you on. Uh, yeah, and, I see you making yeah. notes. You're walking. I know. I've <laughs> had to make notes because, like, this is the other problem with uh, you know, you, with ADHD. About that. <laughs> you, you just don't have enough um, that. But the prefrontal cortex it has it, that doesn't have the storage for all this stuff you want to remember. Yeah. So, like, you mentioned a few. So, this is really interesting. The the fact that you want to have structure in your in your life mm. and i think for me i kind of know that's probably the right thing and i like the idea of it but it also makes me want to run in the other direction because i think my flavor of adhd yes i do i do like some structure in my life but i also like things to be different and, and i want to change things i might want to go out for a walk and and also you know i hate to admit this but like a lot of my days are it depends on how I'm feeling. I'm very kind of, I'm, I'm let my emotions lead me. So like yeah. on today, I might not 
want to do a particular type of job. Um, I might not want, I might want to wake up a little bit later. Um, so I'm interested and obviously we're all different. We've all got different personalities, but how do you get that? It, did, well, first of all, do you have that kind of feeling of, of wanting to change things? And, and do you, do you like to have that flexibility or for you, is it, is it just all about the, the regime and the structure in your life and, and that makes you feel less anxious? I'd love so, to know a little bit more about your perspective there. Yeah, great question. It is um, both. So I live exactly like my brain on its normal, natural default is like how you are. That's what I like. If I'm left to my own devices, I am like, it's a great example. When I first became a mortgage broker, my boss used to get so annoyed because I would do like six months worth of business in a month. And he'd be like, oh my gosh, we found this superstar. He's going to make us millions. And then I'd be like, eh. And then I wouldn't do anything for like, and I'd be like, I've done six months worth of business. I'll just watch Netflix for four, for five months, you know, and I would just kind of like do nothing else. And it'd drive him mad, but I'd always be a high achiever in the, because I'd always hit my target, but never in my, my annual target. So I'm naturally like what you, what you are there. I, I rebelled from structure. Um, but I also have a lot of anxiety and anxiety of new things makes me very angry, like no new places that make mm. me anxious. And so the people I'm a big, a big advocate of this is like, I would, I, I, one thing I like is I look up to people a lot. So I look up to, you know, when you see people who I just think they're, they're just very, very disciplined, they're structured, they're, they, that's the type of person I look up to. And I always think, and I said this to my, my wife, who's a, I speak to about this stuff all the time. So like, you know, I wanted to be that guy. I wanted to be that person that people look at and go, oh, I wish I could do what you, what that person did. And I started realizing that it sounds so bad and I'm very open, but that was motivating. That was like, that was my new obsession. There was people like, you'd see people like David Goggins people like that, who would do things that no one else could do. Or, and there's not just that in any line of work. There's always that one person you're like, how do they do that? How did they, they just do something more? And so for me, the new obsession about really dubbed in about two years ago, but it would be started 2018 when it really started to happen in the, with the video content I was making, but it really ramped up about two years ago, maybe three years ago where I was like, I want everybody to look at me and go, he's just willing to do and this is really sounds really bad so i'm open about it but it's like he's willing to do what no one else is willing to do and that motivating focal point made everything else not really matter so now when i when i think like i want to, i you know i work out every day i run five kilometers every morning i work out for two hours every morning and, I, and one of them is i do five kilometers and i do I, and, and and i hate it every day it's the most boring thing in the world and I call it my boring training because it is literally that. I train myself to be bored and I keep trying to tell myself, you can't do it. Keep going. You can't stop. You keep going. Because my new obsession, the overarching obsession is that, is that he's the guy that can do it. And so using the ADHD to try and tell, trick itself into going, no, you're the person who's willing to sit through those things. You're the person. I found that that's helped me. Um, it's like a weird kind of reverse trick because otherwise ah. I am a like down the YouTube rabbit hole looking at like my wife was laughing about it when she was when she was pregnant and giving birth she was having a c-section for our daughter and I'm sat there and the woman was like what is he doing because you allowed your phones we were like watching because she had the c-section I'm holding the phone to watch and they were like oh he's just she was like he's watching a documentary on um uh, large cats in the uk <laughs> and she was like what and she's like she's like don't ask that's become and, and, and she said this is like the ninth one this week because <laughs> i go wow. off i can just go off on like a down the rabbit hole um and and i but i do realize that um if i want to be successful um how does it if i want to be successful then the real true path to success is to do the things that no one else is willing to do for longer than willing to, than possible. And having kids has made it a lot like the, for me, having kids changed a lot of it because all of a sudden it was like, my wife doesn't work. Um, and so I'm the, as in she didn't, she can work, but we, she didn't want to work and I didn't want it to, we were like, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll raise the kids. We work from home, very involved. So that helped me, um, push myself. 
and I'm quite harsh on myself a lot of times in like quite, quite a lot of negative self-talk in a positive way, but like I am quite like shut up, man up, keep going, keep going, keep going. And then um, I do reward myself with playing a load of video games and having like a scheduled watch the documentary on the cats or the whatever it is. <laughs> well, and I do that daily. I do that every day. There's a bit in the evening and also at lunchtime I have like this, it's like a pressure relief. Where I'm like, and I just let it go, and I watch like I was watching before this. I was watching like a retrospective of um, the original Donkey Kong video game. Like I don't know, idea. I never played the game. I just that to me yeah, is yeah. one of those things yeah. that just it's that I need to watch random stuff, and then I feel super energized and I'm ready to go and do. This isn't boring. This is great. But like I'm ready to go and do speak to people about financial services again and marketing and consulting and that. And then yeah, I find that it's no little moments to just release the yeah. pressure helps. Sorry, I rambled there. Tell me. That's, no, no, no. That's, that's absolutely fascinating. And like, yeah, it's like I watch, <laughs> I watch, there's a guy called James Hoffman uh, talk, talking about coffee and I don't even drink coffee. I, I, I've, yeah. I, I used to love <laughs> coffee, but then I, I couldn't, it gave me heart palpitations. So I had to give mm -hmm. it up. But I'm still obsessed by by that kind of thing. And actually going back to you, were talking about impulse and, and this is one of the reasons why I gave up sugar because I just couldn't stop. So like, yeah. I think you know, we have to find ways that it's going to work for us. And that is really fascinating. I think we're quite different in, in this respect. We're, you're obviously quite driven. So I, my question to you is, is, like, how does ambition and being a high achiever play into this? And, you know, I'm assuming, we've, and we've kind of talked about this, you know, there's, there is this voice in your head, you know, that we've talked about, this negative voice. How do you, how, how does that work with you? You know, you've mentioned anxiety. Um, how do you keep going? Like, how does this high achieving part of you um, take control and push you forwards when sometimes there is that negative voice who's, that's saying you're no good, you can't mm. do it, Ash, you may as well just give up. How do, you, how, how do you manage that? So great, great question. I love that. So to just a preference, just to kind of pre-think pre it. So yeah. I'm actually, I am, a, I am a high achiever, but I'm not a very ambitious person. This is a really like, so people think I am, but I'm like not. Um, I, I've kind of hit where I want to go. Like I'm quite like, I'm, I don't want, like, I would never want a business, um, as in I have my own business, but I'd never want like real staff. I'm quite like, I like my own bubble and to stay in my bubble. Um, but what I want to do is be the best. I'm, I want to be the best I can possibly be. So my obsession is in like personal development. So I want to be the best at what I do, the best father, the best husband, the best, person in fitness the best person at content that's my thing now um which doesn't necessarily mean the, the best business owner <laughs> um but that's but, still that's still i would I still argue that is ambition you might because it depends on how you define it you might not be want to be like this eight figure um multi-global entrepreneur who's mm. speaking all around the world kind of thing you know and i think in all our minds that's probably what we think of as like ambition but you wanting to be the best version of yourself and be the best this and the best that that's still ambitious yeah there's yeah i get you that's that's true that's a good way of putting it, it made me feel better now um so <laughs> i so to answer you then your, your first part of the question you said how do i battle how do i deal with that and how do you so for me it took a long time to um like, like to, to try and like figure out the way that like i how to keep myself motivated what I found in this, and again, people will find this, please, please, like, people understand when I'm saying this, this is just the way my brain is and the way I think. I always have to preface this because people can get triggered by it and it's not. There's the carrot and the stick, and I am very much, as much as I'd love to say I was the carrot, I'm absolutely the stick. Like, I need, I need negative self-talk. And I need, I need um, options off the table. I need to, like, for me, like, I didn't start losing the weight till I literally looked at myself in the mirror and went, you fat, insert swear word, what are you doing? You know, and I, and I, and it led me to, for me, it's been an absolute, like, life changer for me has been um, this actually, which is uh, stoicism, which is what happened for me. So Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, um, being strong, resilient, that type of stuff, that helped me. And my wife, actually, both of us read that. We both, we both read that every day and we both journal about it every day. And it, the shift for me was in being like, I want to live by example for my children and um, my son having it, which is absolutely, he's not diagnosed yet, but he absolutely is. Like he's like <laughs> three and a half now and it's like, 
it's so obvious already um is that i want to show him what you can do and i speak to many people who and, and so that's what like you know speak to many people who's, who, who have it who's, who's who have it and then also like they're that you know they're maybe not achieving what they would have liked in life or and i think no you can't i'm not going to be a statistic i'm going to be thriving at this and and i'm going to show my son and my daughter if she has it as well um that they can be that too and that that motivates me more than anything and do you know where the original motivation came from that was um and you know you might know you know owen video mm. um so like i know Owen. i've had him on my show a few times and when he had that thing going when he when he got diagnosed with cancer and it all went like that i just remember being in awe of how he just fought it and how he just did it he just beat it like he just beat it into submission it was just such an incredible thing to witness so anything when when i remember meeting him and i remember thinking if anything ever happens to me and this was before diagnosis of this kidney disease all this other stuff i was like if anything ever happens to me i want to be the guy that meets it like owen met it and um and he didn't make a victim out of himself he just carried on he just pushed forward and and um you know i give the props to that guy i've said it to him before i did a video on it before but he changed he, he changed my life by doing that by seeing somebody do that and go i've been obsessing on business and this and i just looked at the man and thought that's a man who's willing to do anything for his family to be here one more day to fight for one more day and that to me that hyper obsession that's what kicked in then i was like i'm gonna be that guy and that guy is the guy that when i'm on the gym every day and do working every day and reading every day and you know doing an hour of content every day and all this stuff i do is it's like can you go to bed every night going you know did you fight to be alive today and that that to me it sounds so extreme when i say it out loud but it is genuinely it sounds like a motivational like rah 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 but it is genuinely how i feel um and and i and and yeah that, that's kind of i could talk about forever yeah yeah that, that's kind yeah of yeah I'm well I, I mean owen is an inspiration he's he's such an amazing guy and, and to see him go through that i mean i kind of think that if i was diagnosed with cancer and given um, i can't remember like six months was, or something he had it was, was it very six long. months yeah, yeah six months like nine months less than a year yeah and uh, he's still here years on <laughs> i know and thriving and that, was, and that was the second time at least the second yeah. time that he that he had to go through this and you know, I kind of think, I mean, we don't know what we would be like until, you know, if, if something like that happens to us. But uh, I kind of think, well, I would probably just give up. You yeah, know. keel and, over. And that's I, what I thought. You know, <laughs> and um, having those people that inspire us is so important. And so I wanted to ask you, like, how you, you've, you've done a lot. You seem to be like there's a, there is a lot of self-motivation there. It's the way you're kind of wired and, and you want to be the best version of yourself. And, you know, like just to say to you, like I find that inspiring. Uh, that actually really excites me and it makes me want to, 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 I've always wanted to be, to do that. But, but hearing you say that is so important. And so for me, I know, although I'm an introvert, <laughs> I like you so am I. <laughs> and I love working by myself. I know that I need people. I need cheerleaders in my life yeah. who are encouraging me. And you said to me before, you know, you, you heard me speak last, um, whenever, whenever yeah, it was, and you said some encouraging yeah. remarks. And I, I kind of need that because of, because of the negative talk in my head. Who thinks, Ian, you're no good at this, you're no good at that. So I'm interested Well, just to you. put a pause on that. I didn't just say it was encouraging. Ian's speech, by the way, for everyone listening, was the best speech by far. It was so good. It was so funny. It was educational. I have to give you props and flowers. It was amazing. Like I said to you, I'm off air. But I'm going to put it on here so that people can hear because it, it was brilliant. Like so good. So, so, so good. Let's carry on anyway. Oh, back, thanks, to well, back to me. Back to me. I'll send you the fiver in the post later. So, like, it, uh, how much of... How much of um, you know, the in the encouragers, the mentors, the, those people, um, you've mentioned Owen, mm. who was an inspiration. How important to you are those external people in your life to, to help you get on with what you're doing? So very important. Um, I have two types of things. The most important person to me in my life and my biggest, cheer, my biggest critic and cheerleader, and I've mentioned her many times, is my wife. So with the relationship we have is, um, is is wonderful, but we are people find us a bit strange. We have less of a romantic relationship and more of like a business relate. It's very we, we, she's like my coach, so she will literally hold me accountable to everything. 
like if i come in we i have task to do lists and i do that and she'll sit down and go did you do all your tasks i'm like and i have to show her and she's like could do you think you know and like if i didn't do if i didn't do the video that day she'll go you know why didn't you do that and then i'll go oh well I did this and she's like well are you happy with that like do you, you she never go you should have done it it's always like are you happy do you think that's enough and and I, and I and and if it is she's like if you say it is and that's cool i don't care if she doesn't she, i don't care you can do what you want but she meeting her was the thing that changed it and the two of us are the same we were like that together so she was my i bring everything to her she brings everything to me it's very a lot of people probably wouldn't want our relationship it's pretty intense in that way like if i'm fat she'll go you, you're putting weight on your fat and if i think she's putting weight on i'll say she's looking fat like the two of us are very <laughs> it's so intense like people don't get it at all but that's the way we're wired you know like she doesn't work she wants to be a full-time mom and she was like you're gonna make money i don't want to know about it but she was like but i'm not good but you she was like but you'll never have to change a nappy and i was like really like i'm happy she's like no don't want it. That's our job. She was like, in our world, that's how it is. CEO, CFO. She's like, I, I want to. She just, is, she's very wide that way. She's, she's not English. She's um, Cypriot, so they're a bit different, you know. And like it's, and and that to me, having that strong, someone who believes in me is what it was. It was someone who believes in me no matter what, and then is willing to hold me. So if I go and say like I'm gonna have food, she'll come in and go, No, you're not. Like you don't you're not having for you to like and i need her to do that you know and i'm not it's not like and it's and so i had coaches but none of them were ever as good as her <laughs> like the two of us but it requires a sacrifice of a lot of you know like she's super wonderful in event like you know she's like certain things where she'll be like you don't you're not good in that social situation so i just won't take you it's no point you become a burden in that situation so i won't take you and i know it just drives you mad so just don't and it's like this we don't it's, it's a very good thing with that so she's my number one in in my my um in my guidance for that and um and, and i and i would be i would be lost without her i do think about that quite a little bit like well, what would i do without her? because I, other than that i was just it's gonna sound bad not be more like you but i was like naturally i'm not like how i am now i'm i was very much just free for all do what i want um and so her then in regards to mentors outside of that is I normally have like a um like a sounds quite quite strange again everything I've said is I've never actually said a lot of this stuff on podcasts so I don't know it's really weird so <laughs> you're on the smart ADHD podcast it's, good, it's, 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 it's all fine. strange it's all good <laughs> I'm glad it's just so weird because it's not the stuff I talk about so it's I would um normally like like I need like what well, maybe like a hero worship but like a target so it's like a I need to find somebody and then I have to chase that person down and it's not for any reason I can't compete against myself I have to compete against someone else and they've got to be somebody who is out of my league significantly so and they are a mentor in that way um it's never a negative competition but it is like a I need I need to know so I could pick a person in the past and it'd be like you're the person I want to do what you're doing I'll obsess on you, watch you, listen to you, talk to you, become friends with you, and still say friends afterwards. But but I'm studying you. I need to study this person and how do they move, how do they think, how do they do, and then I will soak it all in. And then normally what happens is I overtake them, which is never what I wanted to happen. But normally that's what happens is over time because I'm obsessed with things, and I just keep moving the bar as to who the person is. Um, and I would say it's like it's like it's, it's kind of like a slight mentorship slight hero worship slight competitive thing mm. um and and i've always i've done that since i was a, a child you go back to your very first one of your first questions of like what was the thing that i've always done that which it also then leads into some some stuff of like also then seeking the approval of that person is quite a bad thing i then go oh i really want that person to sign me off and if they don't which is kind of what i said to you when we're at the events i find those things quite strange because these are all people i massively look up to and then it was like, I want them to all like me, and they do. They are, but it's just a weird feeling. Yeah, but it, yeah. It's it's, it's no, that, that, that's, that's yeah. That that's really interesting because like you 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 said you're more of a in terms of carrot and stick, you're more of a stick person. You the relationship with your wife, you're kind of very honest with each other. It made me laugh, you know, when she said to you, you know, uh, you, you know, you're fat, you need to lose weight. And I remember, I was I, when we got married, like a couple of years after I got married. Uh, I was you know, like you do you put on a bit of weight you know and uh, I was feeling a bit fat and and I was maybe kind of trying to kind of get Helen my wife to say no Ian you're fine but she kind of said 
I said, oh, that's what I said. I said, like, I feel like a bit of a beached whale. And she said, no, you're more like a rounded dolphin, you know? She was trying <laughs> to be nice. And, um, and, I, and I, like, I laughed at it, but I did, I did, t- I, I did kind of crumple a little bit. And like, I'm the kind of person that does need that encouragement. Whereas mm-hmm. I think for you, it seems like you're that kind of, that, that motivated you. It what hurts as well, said. though. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It does hurt yeah, at the yeah. moment. Like, I, I'm still a baby <laughs> with it. I'm still going, oh, don't you call me fat. Like, I'll still <laughs> get triggered by it. But I do then yeah. walk away and go, okay, cool. I need to do this yeah. about it. And I, actually, I did too. I did yeah. too. But but I think, like, a lot of ADHD people could be quite sensitive. You know, mm. there's, uh, what's you call it? Rejection sensitivity oh, disorder or whatever. <laughs> that can be part of it. But I'm just interested. So so on one side, you, you've you got that. That kind of motivates you. But then you also seeking the approval of others and so there is the affirmation side of things there and so like how do you reconcile those like how much of the stick do you need and how much of the affirmation do you need because it sounds like you need both but i'm not sure how that works it's a brilliant it's a brilliant question the more and more i keep talking talking today i'm thinking god i'm just this this is all over the place is it good in a good way uh as in for me like so i think that um i can over index to both too much at different points in my life um I can, if I go too far into the affirmation and wanting the, to, the approval of the other person, I can put that person on a pedestal, and then I put that, and then and then that pedestal comes crashing down when I realise that they're not, they're not, you know, and it's going to sound very honest, that they're not doing my stupidly ridiculous, um, over the top structure that I held myself to. There's, I don't know anybody who does what I do, but I assume that that I must be worse than everybody else. I'm starting to try and accept that. Like, okay, I must be like a 1% of the 1%. But like, I don't know. I've never met anyone who does what I do the way I do it. I don't mean my job. I just mean the way I live. But then I get let down when the others don't. So I have to like not do that. So I can, that, 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 that's quite, can be a real problem. And then I feel like betrayed and let down and upset by that. Um, which is, uh, but man, it's my own doing. I just, um, you know, they never, they never pretended to be anything they were, and I just built them. <laughs> up. As my wife said to me, she said the job is ne- that anything you do is never as good as you think it's going to be. And it's never as bad as you think it's going to be. And she was like, and you just always go from one to the other of how bad it is or good it is, and it's normally just nothing. You know, it's absolutely fine. Like, um, and then the other side is like the the, the kind of negative self talk can be really good until it becomes too much. And, I, and, mm. and it doesn't come too much to me. I can keep going. But it. But there are times where I'm like, you need to stop now. Like, you need to stop. Now, this is like, so like that self-punishment of go more, do more, do more, be more. You know, like that was literally recently, actually, where I was in the gym and I, I was wearing a um, weight vest doing a stepper. So I did 30 minutes of a stepper with 15 kilo weight vest on at 10 speed. It was ridiculous. And I'm dying and my heart rate is like 197. Like it's, like it's going to pop. And that was one of those moments. And I've used every day, literally seven days a week. And I just, and I just was like, one of those moments of like, a, what are you doing? Like, that was like, what, you know, what? You, and I'm listening to mo- music, like the motivational speeches of like, you can go, you can go, you keep going, don't give up. And I'm thinking, if you keep going, you're going to have a heart attack. Like what? Like there was, and that, there's those moments sometimes where I'm like, come on too much and 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 i am like that a lot like i'm like that with all the time i do that a lot so so it's a real hard thing and i just kind of yo-yo between so like a bit like you say about this there's no structure still yo-yo between the two and um sometimes i'm super needy to this person and sometimes i'm so self-motivated that i'm you know like running on like broken feet type level you know and then it's and then and and really the best time is when i'm in the in the in the middle which is hard but it it sounds like you know since particularly since diagnosis you've you've learnt a lot more about yourself. There's that uh, self um, what's the word self awareness. I think it's fascinating what you said about how you you're comparing. It's not you didn't use the word comparing to others, but you're kind of using other people that you look up to, and you're using that to kind of motivate you. But I did want to kind of come on to comparison because mm. you're using comparison in a really positive way. And I, I love that being inspired by others. And I always try and do that. But in the past, I'm much better at this now, but I used to have that, I kind of call it comparison syndrome when I'm comparing myself to others thinking, oh, well, I could never be like that. They're, they're much better than me. I may as well give up. 
that can affect a lot of people with ADHD, I've heard. Um, has has that been an issue for you? And I suppose we're, you know, potentially this can kind of lead into imposter syndrome or that mm. kind of stuff. What's been your experience with that? Um, yes, it has. It has. I, so I'm, yeah, it does. It does. In fact, it, yeah, it absolutely does. It still does now. I probably achieve a tenth of what I could actually achieve because I don't think I'm good enough. You know, like it's, that's like, that's the truth. Like, it does. And I think that what people, the biggest thing I've always struggled with is what people see of me is not who I actually am. You know, like they have a perception of what I am and versus mm. what I actually am. Like I'm actually a naturally an introverted, very quiet, um, very creative kind of guy, you know, and, and actually the external factor is people see, and you'll probably hear it from this, people when you listen to this will think, this guy's like a rah, rah, rah keep going keep you know like the david goggins who's going to carry the boat I'm, I'm not i'm not like that but i have a I, I but i can mimic that as we said earlier like about like i can mimic that trait because i think it will be positive in my life but i'm not naturally like that i'm naturally actually quite a recluse quiet self not self-aware very very nervous uh very anxious person so so yeah, like I find the comparison thing, that's very hard. Coming from a performing background, you'll get it yourself. That's a little bit of baptism by fire. Some of that has helped. And some of it has also probably left some scars. So there's, and I'm sure that's been a very similar thing to you. Like that industry is uh, brutal. And, um, yeah. and, and and there is no like HR, you know, none of that happens. And people are literally like, can't believe they said that to you. I'm like, well, who am I going to tell? Like, who am I going to tell that they said that was this or that or the other? So all in all like um yeah i think that i am a i do struggle with i do struggle with that comparison i'm getting mm. a lot better at it and a lot of this has got a lot of this has got better and i said about daily stoic it was from like extreme ownership for me it was that extreme ownership i toyed with it i've played with it but it was the ownership of i am 100 percent in control of the, the way i think and feel and that has helped um massively but and it's still and i am a working progress on it i am not like by any means a thing but i feel like and i felt like um i didn't i don't like those sides of me those traits of me and i didn't like what i was seeing in society of the traits of that as well and bringing a child into the world and children into the world mm -hmm. and and i and the you know the economy is how it is and everything is how it is i was like we need, I need strong people. And, and the only way that my kids are going to be strong is if I'm going to be strong and that, and the strong, and then I was like, strong people don't, don't do that. They don't compare. They don't do that. They, they keep going. So it kind of keeps going back to what I said before. It's like my kids are the biggest motivator. It's a hard one. I still feel those things. I journal about those things. It happens to me all the time. It happens to me when we're at that event. Like I feel, and then, and then I get back up and go do it anyway. You know, that's not, yeah. this is what, you know, you like, I have to see, like you said, about, this goes back to the Owen thing. I have to, I have to see myself as, it's going to sound really strange. Maybe I keep saying this, but I don't know. Cause it's like inner workings of my brain. I, I don't know if you've ever had this Ian. It'd be interesting to hear yours. Like me might not, but there was always a thing of me with, I always said this to my best friend. I said, when I got married, I was always having this fear of like, if you always think as a, as a husband, I was like, if someone tried to jump me and my wife or pulled a knife, what would I do? This is the thing that used to go through my head in this kind of like weird ADHD thing. But like, what would I do? Because everybody talks about being chivalrous and protecting. I said, but I'm not somebody that could, I'm not a fighter. I'm not strong. I'm quite a coward. I'm, and I was like, I, I, what about kids? Like, well, how would I protect them? How would I, I don't know what I'd do. And there was this, and this would, this plagued me for years. I said to my friend, I was like, I said, you know, so I'm saying this, but I don't know if I could protect them or if I would, or if I'd run away or if I'd, and when I saw Rowan, it was like a, okay. You know, he's not this super mega macho man, which is what we see these things in, and I'm not like that. I was like, but he's done that. And then and so when I started going against that, that's what that's what motivates me and keeps me going is like, will I be that guy who would stand up? And I said this to my best mate about a year and a half ago. I said, I'd fight to my dying breath to save my family now, because I know that, because I've built that that habit. It's just a habit of self talk to yourself to say, when you say you're going to do something, you do it, you beat it, you win, you do it, you beat. And I know I would now. I'm not a fire. I wouldn't know what to do. But like I would, but it was one of those scenarios where I was like, okay. And that ate away at me. Talk about self-doubt. That ate away at me for more than anything else. Yeah. 
was like, well, how would I, prefer, would, how would I in this weird world do the one job I'm supposed to do as a man is protect my wife and my kids? I don't think I could. From a, and, and now I'm like, oh, okay, I probably could. And that's great. And that's that. I don't know if that's a weird thing. Only I think about that or is it just a strange? No, well, I haven't it's thought that exact thing, but I have thought similar things. And again, I think this is partly that that overactive brain th mm -hmm. overthinking things and 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 then doubt creeps in. I think having kids can change it certainly changed a lot for me. I um you know, I, I've I realized how selfish I was before and now I I have a much clearer purpose. And part of that is that protection, I think maybe as well. Um Oh, so you, you've mentioned a few times today anxiety and how that plays a role. And for a lot of people with ADHD, anxiety is kind of, you know, it's there. It, and, and when I got diagnosed, I was really surprised. He says, yeah, you've got ADHD with anxiety. And I, he used, I think he's, he might even use anxiety disorder, which which isn't very nice when he used the word disorder in there. But really, do you have to, do you have to go there? But then I've since realized how much anxiety plays into it. And uh, working with my coach, my ADHD coach, it's been really interesting to see how anxiety feeds my ADHD and how ADHD feeds my anxiety. And it can be quite debilitating, at least for me. So I'm just interested... For you, you've mentioned anxiety. How does I, um, anxiety play a role in your life um, when, when it, I suppose, in comparison to ADHD or in conjunction with ADHD? It's crippling, to be honest. It's my biggest... It's crippling and not, um, but it is. It's in my life all day, every day, all the time. And it has been since I was a kid. I just... I don't remember not being anxious. Terrified of everything. Like, that's what I say. I, I am a... I'm terror... Like... It's that, you know, that scene in the Avengers when he says, what's the trick of being, how are you, you know, how do you control your anger? And he's like, the trick is I'm just always angry. Like, it's, <laughs> it's like that. Like, I just, I'm always in a state of anxiety. And I actually have been opening up more and more about this within, within clients and stuff. Every, st every morning I wake up, and this, and this sounds like every morning I wake up, poor me, I'll be just being honest, is like, and I don't know if you have this or not, every, every day I wake up and think, um, I look at my diary and go, okay, I love my clients. I work I work one-to-one -one with people. I love it. But every day I think, which one of those is going to tell me they want to, they don't want to work with me anymore? Mm. Every day. That happens to me. I've worked with some of these people five years. They send presents for my kids on their birthdays. These guys are like, some of these people are like family. And I look at their names and go, okay, but today's the day they're going to tell me they don't, they don't want to work with me today. I have a, a waiting list close to 300 people. I only work with 20 people. I, my wife made a joke. She said, you've got nearly 100 years worth of stuff. And I still think, and if they leave, what's going to happen? I'm going to never get, like, it just, every morning this plays through my mind. And then it plays doubly on a Sunday when I look at my diary for the week. <laughs> and I go, oh. And every single call, even this one, I'll feel like this. Every single call, I get off the call and go, why did I worry? It was so good. They're great. Mm. They're lovely. And it is like Groundhog Day, every single day. And, it, and it's never gone. And I'm getting to the point now where I'm like, even though I say, my, my, say I keep talking about, my, or mention my kidney disease. So I have, like I said, a rare kidney disease. And this, it, blood pressure is one of those things. Blood pressure increases, is increased by anxiety. Whenever I go into the doctors, my blood pressure is through the roof. I have normal blood pressure every single day. It's off the charts when they're in there. And that's where I say my consultant laughs and he's like, he's like, I don't even look at your results. I said, well, I do because it increases my insurance payments. So it'd be really great if you could just get that to come down a bit because it doesn't. <laughs> but it is like, it just, and, and so yesterday was when, when my, my most recent one and I came away and again, I ran my wife on the way home and I was like, I just got to accept that I'm just always going to be anxious in these appointments. It's never, I'm not going to get to the point where I don't feel anxious. I still feel anxious for everything so it is it's just every it's more i would say it's more than they said i have so when they did my diagnosis it was i have dyslexia anyway but it was adhd i had high iq which was something i did separately to it but it was um but it was also and it but it was also anxiety and ocd tendencies but not an OC, ocd disorder mm. um which is obviously apparent in my daily routine of doing the same thing every single day um but like that 
that the anxiety for me is more debilitating than the ADHD. The ADHD don't really, I, I just is like a, I notice it as it's just, I'm like, oh, I just think a bit different, but with the anxiety, like it affects everything every single day. Mm. And I'm mm. sure, and I'm sure people, everyone who's had anxiety knows what that feeling is like. Every time I say, I see you nodding when I was saying about that, that client thing, every person. And I, you know, I've been talking to my clients about it and they, they like, they're like, oh, well, first of all, don't worry. And then they go, every time I think, cause I know you've got such a long waiting list, you're going to kick me out. And I'm like, no. And they, and they, but I found that people were more related to it the more I open up about it. That's fascinating. It's it's a little bit going into the world of cosmology, you know. <laughs> it's kind of, do you love what I did there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it kind of it, it's a bit like black holes feeding off stars. You know, the, I think the anxiety feeds off the ADHD, and also the ADHD feeds off the anxiety. I think they exacerbate each other. And um, yeah, I, can't, I don't know about just sorry, I'm putting in there because I don't want to ask you a question. I don't know about you. Once it starts, if it really rolls out of control. I don't know. I, I don't, I, there's no bringing it back. I don't know if you're like that. Like if I, I can go to like panic attack level pretty quick if I don't control it, if I don't catch it fast enough. I don't know if yeah. that's a similar thing for you. Yeah, yeah, it's a similar, similar thing. And I think what's really helped me is, first of all, like knowing that it's there, understanding the signs. And I don't always see them, but, but I'm getting better at it. But also, this is something that um, Tamara was talking about on the show about personifying that anxiety so for me my anxiety is a is, is a librarian called lawrence he likes everything sorted he wants everything just so he's wanting to protect me he wants he's got my best interests at heart but he tends to kind of overthink things and and, and start to kind of give feed me negative stuff and then there's another kind of part of my brain I haven't given him a name yet but he's He's, uh, oh, my camera's going. He's, he's, um, and he's like the amplifier. Um, he's an amplifier. So he, uh, amplifies what Lawrence is saying. And so I think it's really important to, I think it's really helpful at least to kind of come up with a, a way of understanding it. If that I makes like sense. That. No, I love that. I've never heard that before. That's a really good point because, um, it's a bit CBD. Is it CP? Was it uh, cognitive CBT. behavioral therapy? Yeah. CBT is my, what my sister always talks to me about. It's very that. I mean, it's not that, but it's a similar kind of like when you're creating something. Oh, I love that. I'm going to try that now. <laughs> Definitely. I'm just um, no worries. I'm just sorting out my camera. Sometimes it does this. I think when it gets hot. It's to right, we'll see what happens. It might it might stop in a minute. Cool. Okay, so we, we've kind of talked a lot about the negatives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that's really interesting. I and you, but you have uh, over the time you have talked about how how you kind of strategies and tools that you've used to help manage that. You mentioned the the whole idea of the, the you know the Stoics mm. has, has helped you. You've talked about other ways. Are there any other kind of strategies or tools that you found most helpful in managing your ADHD? Not that we haven't really covered. I don't think. I think. Um, for mm. yeah, for me, I just. Um, Oh yeah, so I would say like I I just I just uh, I do like a weird kind of three it's a three part part thing that I do which might help people it might not depends on how it go but it's um I it's like past future present so I note everything so I have a AI thing that records all my meetings that notes everything down and I use that religiously because without it I won't remember what I said that's been something I realised so I have that and all my notes are stored. And I keep them for everything. So every appointment, I just open it up and everything is there. The video recording there, the whole thing is all saved there. So it's, it's about note keeping has been really life saving to be successful and run a business with it. Then my then it's time blocking. So that's my past. Present is time blocking, uh, meaning that I do everything religiously via time blocking because otherwise I will not know what's going on. Um, and I meticulously do that. I won't go too deep into that because it's, it's like a whole other thing on its own. And then I have, um, like, so past, future, and present. So past, sorry, future, meaning if that was actually the, the diary one. And then the present one, sorry, is tasks. So I have a to-do list oh, to do list open on my phone all the time. So if you ask me, Ash, can you do this for me? I'm like, yeah, cool, and I put it on there. And my night, every night, I have to make sure they're ticked off. So I'm always keeping notes of everything we spoke, I've spoken about with every person, even my friends. They have a folder on my one note that's like, me and Albert just had a chat. We spoke about this. So that when he rings me and we chat, I go, cool, open it up and go, oh, he's, they've done this, his work's done. I keep note of everything. 
and um, and and then same with like you said then the tasks and the and the diary and those three things have been a game changer but a game changer for many people but they're for me because i just do not remember i just mm. don't but in the moment i massively do so and i'm sure you might have a similar thing in the moment i'm giving you the best advice i could possibly give you or my my I'm really deep conversation and then they'll say you know that thing you said and i'm like no i don't know what i said like i don't remember so now i'm like yeah i do here it is we said this we said that or if i said to you i'm going to do something then I, and i'll do it because i just and and People and one thing I would say as well with the ADC that I, that I found with that as well is working within you know finance and things like that is that by telling people like if I don't do this send me a reminder please don't be offended like like please don't feel bad that I like you know that you have to remind me I have ADHD I won't remember so if I if, if you're like I said I was going to do it today and I don't do it by the, end of the day send me a reminder saying Ash you said you're going to do that thing today I'm not going to get annoyed that helps me. And so that I found mm. that being open and honest with people like that has really helped. Um, that's more of like a couple of practical things that yeah, no, that's, really helped. That's really helpful. And I've, I've found similar things, uh, having systems and, and processes, tools to help to counteract that. And yeah, it certainly kind of listing things and to-do lists and, and apps and things like that has really helped. Now, you've mentioned like mentioning that you have ADHD to your clients and that's that's for some people it's quite a scary thing you know it's getting, it's like coming out you know yeah and i was quite i was quite nervous about saying i had adhd because there were so many misconceptions so many myths so many stigmas and yes things are i would say at least a little bit easier and there is more understanding out there but have have you faced any misconceptions or stigmas about you know saying that you have adhd and how have you addressed those um to be honest, no, not really. Like, I don't really know, like... So I... Again, it goes back to extreme ownership. I... And some people might not like this. It's not my client's fault that I have it. And that's something mm. that I am a big advocate of. It's not my client's fault I have dyslexia. It's not my client's fault I have ADHD. And so if they've come to me for a specific type of service... It's my job to 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 make sure they get that service. Now my service has been built around the fact that I have it, you know. So like, so I build my brand around it, and that's what kind of. But I don't, I don't find that anyone has really cared about it. So I, and for me, I I swear I've, I always find coping mechanisms to be like, okay, how can I still deliver? Because I think sometimes we can be like, not we, but some people, and and I've seen this in in friends and family members who have it, who have other things as well as ADHD. And they can go, oh, well, poor me, I can't do it because of this, or I can't because of that. Like, you know, I, I, like that doesn't doesn't really sit well with me. So I don't really, I, like, like, I like being dyslexic, you know, dyslexic, but I became a mortgage broker and passed all my exams and did all, just find ways. So I think the biggest part of it is being transparent. But I do get it. It depends on it depends on the industry you're in as well, I guess. Like at the event we're at, everybody's going to say ADHD. Like in creative spaces, it's kind of my superpower in where I work because it it's a it's an industry that is naturally not that way. Um, in mm. the creative in the marketing space where we're all in and the coaching so that was one thing that I reinforced me when I was at that event. I was like, I am never trying to try and be a coach for coaches. Because that's there's just I'm I'm the same as everybody in this room, but in my line of work, I'm the only one. It sounds like Winnie the Pooh song. That's my brain going through there. I'm the only one. Um <laughs> You know, they're tiggers, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but the, um, yeah, that's good. So, so it hasn't really been a problem yet. Um, I have had the, the dyslexia one was though. I'd have people say things like that. You know, that would be a, so I guess I'd maybe learn how to deal with it with the dyslexia. So the ADHD is less, less, mm. the, like, yeah. yeah. That, that that could be the case. Like, we've all got different experiences. Like I, for me, when I, when I, I was starting to explain to people that I had ADHD. And there is that element of sometimes we can overshare. So I have went through a period <laughs> of like, Ian, like, shut up. You do, they, they don't need to know you have ADHD, but... Uh, oh, and I do that. Few, uh, that oversharing yeah, few, thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And like, some people said to me, like, oh, ADHD? Like, what's that? And, you know, I've heard of that, you know, and you don't seem to have ADHD. So they, they become like a like a, a, psych, a, psych, a psychiatrist straight away. And and then I said, well, you know, things, they say, well, what do you struggle with? And I say, well, you know, chronic procrastination and stuff like that. And then they say, well, surely everyone struggles with that. And and that kind of feed, fed into my self-doubt about it and stuff like that. So 
think since then I've I've learned a lot more about how to how to respond. But uh, it can I think it's less of an issue. I think there's a lot more understanding about it, uh, which is which is good. So just before we finish, we've talked for quite a while, and, and it's been so good getting into really deep stuff. Um, moving moving forwards with you, like so, there's certain things that you still find hard. Like you mentioned this this conference, going mm. to that. Like if you were to go to a similar conference in a couple of months' time, uh, knowing what you know about yourself, that you're an introvert, that you start to maybe overthink, you start to. And the other thing, of course, we haven't talked about is that as ADHD people, we tend to be very intuitive. We we kind of read the situation really well, and that can be an advantage and a disadvantage. So, like knowing what you know about yourself, what are some of the things that you're gonna put into place to help you move forward? Not I'm not just talking about conferences, but just generally speaking, what's what's the next stage for you? Yeah. So, um, to be fair, conferences and networking is is probably the next stage because I've very much kind of got a handle of and started to master the how to do it in my life how to, so it's it's really moving into how do i take what the life i've built in my own little world that's really you know far in north cylinders and how do i start to create that so it can expand out and so i can go to that's probably going to be it and one of the things mm. i would say from those events <clears throat> um that i would come away from was a big big thing for me was i was like i should have if you are, and this, I think this is like, like anyone listen to this who, if you are introverted, nervous, going to events, what I should have done, looking back, was reached out to all of you individually and gone, hey Ian, really looking forward to seeing you at the event. Just with a heads up, I am a little bit of an introvert, so if you do see me, I might need a little bit of a, just kind of an arm around me and hey how are you because i am a little bit like that and i might not come across that way but i really do want to chat with you and get to know more about you i should have done that because mm. i did the post about it afterwards and everybody messaged me going oh i couldn't i wanted to see you and i, and I thought oh you idiot like what that's what i should have there was a staring me in the face it was so obvious and i think that goes back to like being open about your adhd it's like walking away from it, i was like that's what i would have got more out of the event I would have got mm. a lot more out of the event because there was lots of people I wanted to hang out with and talk to, but I will not make that first move because the anxiety in the back of your mind going, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, Oh my gosh, why would they want to speak to me? Whereas if you did, but if it's that thing of, and I always say this to my clients, so a lot of this stuff is stuff I say to people and then I go, why did you not do it yourself? I'm sure you have the same mm. thing. You take your own yeah. advice is I always say to my clients, they talk about that when they're doing mortgage stuff. And I'm like, if you don't tell the client, what's going on don't get annoyed when they can't they, they have no idea what's going on you know like they, they, they think you've done nothing because <laughs> yeah. you haven't told them what's going on and it was that thing of like i didn't expect you guys to be you, know, you me and you chatted and it was really good but like that was that thing of like don't expect people to be a mind again that's why i go back to this extreme ownership it was my fault it was no one else's fault i went to that environment i didn't i had misjudged it i'd and i'd misjudged it as well because everybody was like super excited to see me but I hadn't really factored in this idea of great. Well, how do I talk with people? And as I said, oh, I'm a deep talker and I'm prone to oversharing. And that. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just going to say yeah. you can edit if you don't want no, to edit. Okay. You, you, you carry on because I'll, nice. I'll just. I didn't know I was going to do a script little, so I thought I'll be quiet. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, no. So I, that that to me was those things. I think with the with the whole, uh, you know, expecting people to just be able to read my mind. I should have looking look at hindsight. That was my it was my job to do that. I should have um, should have just done that. And if I'd done that, I tell you what, I, I had a wonderful time anyway. It was a great time. I'm definitely going back next year. But it. If, if all the speakers are cool <laughs> so, so <laughs> yeah, no yeah. it's no pressure mike <laughs> no. no um but like i yeah i think yeah like i'm sorry not mike matt um but if i if i would say um mike was the guy i spoke to yesterday i was thinking oh. um but i would say that um that yeah like like taking ownership of it again it was that was the thing i would do and trying mm. to navigate that in the real world and, and and also realizing that other people feel all the same way. That's something that's really helped as well as I'm like, you that's feel true. the same. <laughs> and, and putting that post out, I think was, was great because it is, 
people actually, I think, came out with very similar stories, and, and that's good for them. It's good for you. It's good. Good to bit of bit of bit of honesty. Um, we're almost out of time. So I, I just I wanted know. to kind of ask you this this final question uh, before we find out a little bit more about how can pe people find out more about you, and that is for anyone who's been watching or listening and really identifies with some of the stuff with your story what would you what would be your advice for them um if they if they're struggling with adhd and they're wanting to to strike to well to to move forwards and and what would be your biggest takeaway for them my biggest takeaway honestly would be just grab it by the horns and just deal with it like that sounds so over the top but it's that it's that, ex that ownership of it own it and realize it's not a bad thing it's a good thing, it, but, it, but it's you having con complete control over it because there are a lot of things you can control, a lot of it. And um, I think that that is, is, is where I think many people go, go wrong is that the only person who loses when you say, I've got ADHD, I can't, I can't, I can't, all of these words we say ourselves, self-fulfilling prophecies, then the only person that you're losing is you. That's the only person. I'm a big Star Wars fan. I said that before. I think it's like, it's that do or do not. There is no try. There was an element of like, I have it and I do this. You mm. know, it's, it's that scenario. And that was for me, like, it, it's that. It, when I, when I you know, grabbed it by the horns and said, I'm going to, um, there's a great, great kind of thing that helped me with this. I'll say in a minute, but I, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to look, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to master this. It's not going to dictate, to, to, like, determine who I am. I, it will be part of my story. And I think you can say the same with this. You think of it like that. It's like it's part of your story, but it's not who you are. And um, that helped me. And there's something great that I, I listened to, actually. It wasn't when this happened, but it was when I was diagnosed with my, with my kidney problem. And it was after the, this. The data had already been done. And it was like, a, that was the hardest thing. I've, that was, like, very scary. And there was, and it was the same thing that when that happened, the ADHD thing all clicked in because it was like, I just dealt with all the problems at once. And it was, there was a great, it was a listen to a book and it was a David Goggins book, but he, cause I was just like, I needed something that was just someone telling me to, to man up. Um, but he, there was a quote in it that just absolutely rang true with me more than anything else, which is he said that everybody, when they run into a dark place, they run into a dark tunnel and everything goes black. We can't see, and we freak out. And the first thing you want to do is run out the other way. But if you wait and you sit in the dark, you will adjust to the light and you can see clearly. And you'll adjust to the dark and you'll be able to see very clear. And once you can see clear, it's no way near as scary. And that, to me, that's where the medical papers and the, it was the understanding of it and sitting in it and fighting the anxiety of both the kidneys, of the dyslexia, of all of it, anxiety of the to sit and go, you will, I'll, I'll be beaten. I'll beat you before you beat me. And, and then you come out of the side going, yeah, no, when people say ADHD, people can't be organized. That's the rubbish. I'm the most organized person I know. Yeah. And you know, I don't know anybody who's more organized than me. And that's like to a fault, <laughs> but it's like, but it is using it. You're, you, you can use it massively to your own advantage once you start to figure it out, but you've got to face it for me anyway. That's what I found. That's what I'd say to them. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And like, as, as we've kept on saying, like everyone's experience is different. Mm. There's many different types of ADHD as well, people. And if you've been touched or like by anything in, in this, if you're concerned, then there are people out there, medical professionals who can help. So don't, um, don't cope alone. But we'd love to hear from you. Uh, I'm sure Ash would love to hear from you. I would love to hear from you. Do get in touch. All of Ash's uh, links will be in the show notes. Um, so just go to smartadhd.me. You can find out all of that. But what, where, where, where do you tend to hang out, Ash? Where, where in, on the socials and all that kind of stuff? Where do you tend to be? Yeah, so like for anyone listening to this, obviously there's no none of my content that's going to be at all relevant to anything you guys are interested in. <laughs> um, but where I the best place to reach out to me is either LinkedIn or Instagram. So if you want to reach out, I love. I'm happy to talk about this stuff. You can voice note me. We can back and forth in DMs. I'm really cool. We'd love, love to do that type of stuff. Um, so 
but go to Instagram, which is at Ash Borland or, Inst- or uh, LinkedIn, which is um, Ash Borland there as well. They're the two main platforms that I'm good for like direct messages, but my content, there's no point even talking about it because it's just completely irrelevant to what you guys well, do. Well, you never know. <laughs> not, nece- not necessarily, not necessarily. But uh, thanks, Ash. It's been great. Thank you. It's been a real privilege um, hearing your story, digging deep into that. And I've learned loads. I've been inspired by uh, what you've said. And uh, it's... I think this is how we can grow and how we can learn. Um, So thank you. I really appreciate you coming on the show.